fishing in Lilliput. Not many of us can get fishing in such rivers as Test and Itchin, where a pounder is a little fish. Nor can many of us fish regularly in such rivers as the Dove, the Eden, or the Derbyshire Wye. We may get a day or two on such rivers in a season, but for the most part we have to make do with fishing less obviously good. Happily, however, the pleasure of fishing is not strictly measurable in weight of fish or in its annual cost, and some of the most delightful days are to be had on waters where anyone may fish who has a license, closes gates, recognises that hedges are meant as barriers and not as sporting obstacles to be broken through, and never walks in unknown grass. These waters are of two kinds, those without any fish in them, and those with many fish but small. These last, to those who know them, give some of the pleasantest fishing in the country. Sometimes, indeed, when the big rivers are out of order, many a man with the right to fish a nobler water has found himself well advised to leave that water and to go to fish in Lilliput instead. In Lilliput, everything is small, but the visiting fisherman remains, regretfully, his natural size. Small boys have an advantage in that country. Parts of the rivers in Lilliput are defended by bush and bramble, which deter small boys much less than gullivers. Other parts are so open that the man mountain who would catch a fish there must be able to hide behind a molehill or a thistle. And until he knows them, Gulliver is overconscious of indignity in creeping down so low to catch such little fish. For in the rivers of Lilliput the trout run small, from six to sixteen to the pound, some say thirty-two. Though you will always meet a man who knew a man who hooked and lost a great fish that was six ounces, if it was a dram. In Lilliput, men who elsewhere jeer at an eight-inch limit are inclined to complain of a six-inch limit as too big. Returning from Lilliput to the normal-sized world, men find themselves excusing the little fish by saying that they eat very sweet. So they do. But to say so is like finding that the best that can be said of a man is that he made a beautiful corpse. The little fish of Lilliput deserve a handsomer obituary. Let me suggest a few of the praises that they earn. They are great fighters for their inches. There is almost no day on which they will not rise. When they rise, they rise heartily. Indeed, they rise with such decision and promptitude that they ought to be both wealthy and wise. Very wise they are not. Wealthy? They are not in a rich country, but in one where to keep a full stomach is riches. And they, by August, are plump as little aldermen and a great deal livelier. The secret of getting the best out of fishing in Lilliput is to pretend that you are fishing in Brobdignag. Attack a rising three-ounce fish as if you were trying to get a rise out of a three-pounder. It is as difficult, and therefore as interesting, to float your dry fly past that diminutive nose as it is to offer it to a larger fish. You will probably get more fish with your three wet flies, but you will get more satisfaction out of a single dry one. The dry fly, even when taken by one of these hopper my thumbs, requires a deliberation in the strike which gives to a rise an importance far greater than can ever be attributed to the sudden pluck and pull that make up the simultaneous rise and strike proper to the wet fly. Use a rod that will cast a short line and use the finest tackle you can get. Give yourself a chance of being broken by one of the rare quarter-pound veterans of the river. If you find you're getting too many fish, raise your size limit by quarter inches. A careful adjustment of mind and tackle alike will give you days of as good fishing in Lilliput as ever you could get among the Brobdignagian monsters. Disregard absolutely the advice of the books about fishing straight on if you fail to rise a fish that you have spotted. Make up your mind that if you choose to catch a particular fish of large size, say seven inches, you will catch him, even if you have to smoke a pipe between each cast. Watch the fly on the water as if you were fishing for the epicures of the chalk stream. If the fish in Lilliput have a vice, which I do not like to admit, it is that they are too willing to take any fly you offer them. But even in Lilliput, it will be found that on each day there is one fly that they will more willingly take than any other. 
If you make your own flies, you can be surer of appreciation in Lilliput than elsewhere. But here and there, you will come across a little trout who rejects your fly and yet takes another the moment it has passed him. Such a trout is very valuable, no matter what his size. And when you outwit him by giving him just the fly he is preferring, he will set you up in your own mind for half a day. My own favourite river in Lilliput is the... But who gives away such secrets? It turns almost into a river of Brobdingnag before it reaches the sea, but that is many miles away. Tiny as it is, it is three rivers in one, providing three several sorts of fishing. One length of it, where the quarter-pound veterans lie, is in a deep gully overhung with trees, almost dark at midday. Here, in the tunnel of green leaves, are short, deep pools. You must wade if you are to get near the water at all, and stoop if you are to get along under the boughs. There is no room for a nine-foot rod. This length is for the hottest days. Another length is fast, though much broken with lilliput boulders. It invites the wet fly. A greedy friend took six dozen trout from this length one day, using three wet flies. Even here, a burly, bushy little dry fly is a pleasant sight, dancing down the rapids, and does, I think, take slightly bigger fish. The third length is the best. Its water is slow, with weeds instead of boulders. Its pools are very long, with a slowly smoothing surface below the runs. The only cover on either side of it is given by short rushes, each of which just now carries one of those little tufts which will not part with any fly that touches it. It is, in fact, a perfect length for dry fly fishing. The man who has fished up that short length and reached the top of it with, say, six fish and his temper well in hand has done something to be proud of. And since the fish are lilliput fish, he is not punished for his success by a heavy weight to carry as he walks back down the valley, the last of the sunlight on the mountains, the white scuts of the rabbits vanishing in the dusky fields and the first owls calling. In lilliput, no sunset is ever spoiled by the strap of a heavy basket insistently cutting the shoulder. The benign moment. The benign moment is difficult to define or explain, though every fisherman knows it. It is like one of those sudden silences in a general conversation when, in England, we say, an angel passes, and in Russia, in the old days, they used to say, a policeman is being born. Everything feels and looks different. The fisherman casts not in the mere hope of rising a fish, but knowing that he will rise one, concerned only to hook it when it comes. He knows that even the hooking of it is more likely than at other times. Weather, river and fish seem suddenly to be on the angler's side and prepared to do their best for him. This is not the moment to be wasted in putting on a fresh cast. Hawthorn trees seem to know this, and joining in the happy conspiracy, skilfully evade the flies that in moments not benign, they reach out to clutch greedily behind the angler's back. Or is it that, in these moments, trout rise so near the fisherman that he is never tempted to lengthen his line in dangerous places? But in other moments, all places are dangerous. Flies cling to moss, to stones, to clothing, whirl themselves tightly round the rod, or, in an instant, turn a straight piece of fine gut into a cat's cradle. When this last happens, wise fishermen take it as a kindly indication that the moment is not benign, and that their flies may as well not be on the water. If they swear, they do so with such good temper and even gratitude that their words fall like a caress. They do not pull off the cast to be disentangled at home, but there and then sit down patiently at the riverside observe with calm pleasure a wagtail or a dipper, enlarge their souls to leisure, and, without hurry, reduce the cat's cradle to order, stretch the cast anew, and know that they have lost no time, no good time, at all. And when this elaborate business is finished, if they do not arise suddenly with violence and stride with determination upstream, they have a good chance of being rewarded in other coin, beside that of moral satisfaction, in which, already, they have been richly paid. Half a dozen sand martins may be skimming the water, picking up from above their share of a hatch of flies that the trout will be attacking from below. 
more. Trout may be rising in the very water which the angler left when he came ashore to do his disentangling. The fish that was put down by being offered the tangle of gut, that it was not his business to unravel, may now be rising again and ready to take the fly that was in that tangle, now happily straightened out. Again and again it happens that the benign moment follows immediately upon a moment so far from benign that it has compelled the fisherman to give the river a rest. So often indeed does this happen that I am sometimes tempted to think that the benign moment is a wholly subjective affair, that it is less a state of river than a state of mind, and that when we are told to take a rest when we are fishing badly, we are really being told to create, artificially, a benign moment for ourselves. But when actually fishing, I am quite sure that the benignity of the happy moment when it comes is not of my making, is not dependent on me, and is dependent on some subtle combination of circumstances, not under my control. It is a meteorological, not a psychological phenomenon. And with that, I am back again at the difficulty, not so much of defining it, as of explaining it, of analysing it into its component parts. I sometimes fancy that it depends on some slight change in atmospheric pressure. This would explain why it seems not only to make the trout more willing to rise and to take flies well into the back of their mouths, but also to improve the fishermen. I fancy that if, in addition to all the tackle we already carry with us, we could not do it if we had as many fish to carry as our grandfathers. We had with us barographs of sensitive nature, registering changes of pressure, so that we could observe them from hour to hour, and even from minute to minute. We should find that the benign moments of which we were conscious would be marked in some way in the line traced by the barographs recording needle. Those moments are not to be explained simply as coincident with a hatch of fly, in moments other than benign, flies may sail down river in our marders without the slightest effect on our baskets. And in any case, how judge between cause and effect? A hatch of fly does usually seem to accompany a benign moment, but may not the flies, like the trout and the fishermen, be encouraged by the moment instead of being its cause? Then, too, on our swiftly varying rivers, it is possible that prolonged observation would show that the benign moments would be indicated in some way on a curve that should represent, from minute to minute, the rising and falling of the water. For example, a benign moment often occurs when the river first shows to the fish signs that it is going to rise. To the fish, I say. For they know all about it before the duller angler has drawn his deductions from the flotsam carried on the stream, the first dry leaves picked from its shores as the river, higher up, brimmed above the line at which they had been left. And when, after a freshet, the river clears, such moments are sometimes to be enjoyed. But here we seem to be considering good conditions for angling in general, rather than the conditions of those rare moments that sometimes make the difference between a blank day and one on which the returning angler sings or whistles in the dusk. The benign moment proper occurs, and is most noticeable when it does occur, in a day on which the conditions for fishing are, in general, poor. Perhaps on account of our unsettled weather and uncertain streams, the benign moment may be considered as a phenomenon characteristic of North Country fishing. On the equable chalk stream it occurs, but is somehow less important. On the prettiest chalk stream in England I have known a dull hour to be followed by this miraculous change, as if I had closed my eyes for a moment and opened them on a different day, as if a wand had been waved and a spell loosed by some invisible being in the water meadows. In the South, however, the coming or not coming of the benign moment is not one of the chief interests in the day. Whereas with us, the possibility of its coming is the thing that enables us to put up with much hardship and disappointment. In this weather, with the barometer jumping up and down like a grasshopper, with the river one foot in drought and one in flood, to one thing constant never, the hope of the benign moment sustains the fisherman through many barren hours and sometimes puts something in his basket at the end of them.